dear friends, dear colleagues, welcome. Uh, we will be uh, we will be performing the sixth webinar of Professional Voice Society this week. And as you well know, we are trying to make these webinars uh, in every week in Thursdays. And one week we are making it in Turkish and the other week in English. Uh, today I have a very special guest, uh, a very uh, good friend of mine, and and he is uh, Professor Ahmed Geneit. Uh, Ahmed Geneit is the head of pediatrics department of uh, Helsinki University Hospital, and he has double specialty degrees. He is both an otolaryngologist and a pediatrician. And for the ones uh, that are not usually with us, pediatrics is the medical specialty. I mean the medical doctor who is dealing with communication disorders, as you well know. And uh, dear Ahmed Geneit is now also serving as the president of the Union of European Pediatricians. And he is uh, one of the founders of the European Academy of Pediatrics, which uh, is established to, be, to, uh, to increase the knowledge and practice of uh, medical doctors uh, on pediatrics. He has also founded as a member uh, the Finnish Society of Laryngology. And he has now a nice team, a multidisciplinary team dealing with voice patients in pediatrics department of uh, Helsinki, Finland. And we will be uh, very happy to see you among us in the uh, 2021 UEP Congress in Antalya. Uh, we were planning to make it on October 2020, but uh, because of the pandemics, we will be uh, we will be rescheduling it to. Uh, October 2021, as most of the subspecialty congresses uh, moved from 2020 to 2021, we will be also uh, performing the congress in 2021. You can always uh, have the updated information from the website. We will be making the official announcement about this in a few weeks' time. Uh, Ahmed, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Uh, both, uh, both, uh, I mean, in an education way and in a friendly way. So I am very happy to see you. Uh, although we have a computer between us, I cannot hold you, I cannot touch you, but it's always uh, great to be with you. So the stage is yours. Thanks a lot. I'm, I'm really happy to be with you as well. Uh, it, it has been a pleasure. I've been uh, uh, in Turkey for a couple of times, or actually three times so far, and two of them were with you and with the uh, Turkish colleagues in Izmir and in Istanbul, and, and they were fantastic. Um, Turkey is, is very, very close to my heart. And I'm really happy that I'm, I'm going to talk today about this topic because this is one of the things that I was saying a moment ago that uh, it suffered uh, not much, um, um, let us say, disturbance from the COVID-19 pandemic. We stopped it for a couple of weeks or three weeks, and then we continued with the uh, office-based procedures uh, especially for vocal fold paralysis and also for atrophic dysphonia. Uh, what I will be going through is, um, is something that is probably known for you uh, to a certain extent. I will tell about my experience, what we have been doing, and uh, I will be happy to get the questions, if any. Uh, what I will tell is a very short introduction about voice physiology. Just let us say it is a reminder. Uh, then we will go through a vocal fold augmentation for vocal fold paralysis, when to do it, uh, what kind of choice for the material uh, that you have, and then what we call the quick intervention model that we are applying here in Helsinki, and it is also applied in different other university hospitals. And then we will go to uh, the last part, which is how to do the augmentation for atrophic dysphonia and what kind of options do you have. Uh, starting with the vocal fold physiology or the voice physiology, what I always like to say is that it is not only about the normal vocal fold movement, so it is not only about if the vocal folds are moving or not, uh, but there are many other things. You have to keep uh, uh, in mind that you need to have a normal lamina propria. So uh, a patient who, uh, who comes to you even if he is old enough that you suspect that there is atrophic dysphonia uh, in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the situation of the patient or atrophic vocal folds, 
you always have to uh, bear in mind that sometimes if this patient had a, a polyp or some other uh, lesion removed from the vocal fold, then there can be some kind of a scar which is causing a disturbance with the voice. Um, also the motoric activity, uh, the vocal fold paralysis usually means in our mind that the vocal fold is not moving, but the vocal fold paresis can be happening and it can be some kind of a limitation of the movement of the vocal fold, which is not 100%, it can be only 50 or 60. The optimal lung support, which is something that you would expect to have among normal uh, population, but still you have to bear in mind that if a patient comes to you with uh, with COPD and or with, uh, with hard asthma. So these are situations that can affect the voice as well. Uh, the optimal synchronization between the closure and the lung support, uh, which is something in which uh, voice therapy can be quite helpful, and the optimal muscular activity inside and outside. So it is not only about the vocal folds activity, but it is also about how the other muscles around the neck, and if you go back to many of the studies done on the laryngeal frame and the muscles, especially the external laryngeal muscles, they do have an effect on the voice. Some of this work was actually done here in Finland a long time ago by Otto Sonninen and then by Erik Wilkman. And uh, it, it's very nice to bear that in mind because all of these, is contributing to the normal voice. And when there is a disturbance in one or two of these things, then you expect to have a problem with voice. I will go directly to the vocal fold paralysis because this is probably what is uh, usually on the mind. And one of the questions that we, we always face uh, or we always uh, um, face when we, um, when we deal with uh, vocal fold paralysis patients is, what is the best operative technique and what should be done. Here is a video of one of the patients. I'll try to put the, uh, to have the sound a little bit down. Hopefully it will not be quite uh, strong on your speakers, but let us see this video. Here we got a, here we got a, here we got a, here we got a, here we got a. So, for this video of a vocal fold paralysis on the right side, if you show this to a number of nutritionists, laryngologists, ENTs in different places around the world, some of them will be saying, okay, this is a patient that should get uh, injection. And some of them will say fat injection, some of them will say fascia injection. Uh, in other places, they would go for thyroplasty and when you ask them about the reason that they are choosing one of these operations, they will tell you because of how the gap is. Some will say that it is about having a gap less than three millimeters or more than three millimeters, which is actually in some literature, old literature. But the problem is that it is totally subjective. You cannot measure the vocal fold gap or what is remaining between the vocal folds uh, except by laser triangulation, which is something that no one is using in clinical work. So in the end, it remains to your totally subjective evaluation of the patient. And it is to a huge extent affected also, but what you have been taught while you are being a resident and what, do you, what is being done in your hospital. In my opinion, and what I do is that I usually think that a small gap, in my experience, can get vocal fold augmentation, and usually the patient will be happy if you do that with fascia, which is probably one of the very, very few substances, what can be actually the only substance which is going to be there in the vocal folds, staying for 10 to 15 years, and it hardly makes uh, a foreign body reaction. If there is a big gap in the vocal fold, uh, between the vocal folds, then I would go for thyroplasty type one. I wanted to say this because this is one of the things that usually make people think about what they should be doing. 
And when it comes to the injectable, and right now we're going bit by bit to the office-based injections, there is a huge number of injections available on the, in the market. Um, I personally like to divide them according to this category, which is like uh, the first one is the category for those that stay less than one year, gelatin, collagen, hyaluronic acid, uh, radius voice gel, and then I have the intermediate ones that are going to stay for one to two years. And then I have the long ones that we can assume that they are permanent and they are going to stay for more than two years. This is, a, a, in my opinion, a very important table because when you look at it, you will easily get into your mind that if we are talking about vocal fold paralysis that is idiopathic and we don't know if the patient is going to regain her vocal fold movement or not, then it will be excellent to go with the first category because the patient will be getting her voice back uh, with, for example, hyaluronic acid. The voice is going to be regained. Uh, the material is going to be there for four to six months. And then if the patient uh, vo vocal fold starts to move, then the patient is going to have be happy. But if it stays uh, uh, paralyzed, then after that time, you can go for permanent inject injection or for thyroblasty. For the middle category here, the materials that stay from one to two years, these are the kind of materials that I personally would prefer to use for patients with vocal fold atrophy. Because these patients, mostly elderly, they can come to you in the outpatient, they can get the injection with calcium hydroxyapatite. It will stay there for one or two years. The patient get the injection under local anesthesia, goes back home, and then comes to you after one to two years. If you have a patient who has a vocal fold that is paralyzed and you're sure that it is not going to move, then you have the option of going with fascia, which has been developed by Richtenen back in 19, uh, or actually we had, had been used by Richtenen from back in the 90s, and or thyroplasty, which is, uh, of course, in this situation, uh, a, different, uh, a different surgery, and it is not uh, augmentation. Uh, with the Vox implants, I don't have experience of using it. I didn't use it before. Um, I only know of a couple of places that are using Vox implants, and there has been some reported cases of rejection or foreign body reaction. So I, I don't really have the ability to comment on it, but what I have been personally using here in Helsinki has been the fascia with very good results when there is a small gap and it stays there in the vocal fold for most of the patients. Now I will go to uh, how I do it. What, are, what I'm doing right now is the vocal fold paralysis patients when they come to me. What I used to do before is that if I have an idiopathic vocal fold paralysis, then I will just wait for six months. If it doesn't move, then I will do the injection. And uh, I used to wait for, in my opinion, what is a quite long time, because six months is quite long for these patients. If there is a, a young patient that's 34 to 50, or even 60 right now is young, and this patient needs to go to work, and he or she has a problem with, with voice, then we really have a problem that is affecting the patient's professional and also the social abilities and the social communication. So right now I shifted that totally. Well, when there is an unknown etiology, we do offer the temporary augmentation, as I said, with hyaluronic acid, and the patient is able to go back to work, the patient is able to go back to uh, deal with the other socially, if the vocal fold starts to move, then the augmentation material is going to disappear more quickly and uh, the patient will be happy. If the uh, vocal fold does not move, then it will be staying there till we can have the decision that what we see right now is permanent paralysis. We need to go for fascia or for thyroplasty. Um, if you know the etiology from the beginning, if you have a patient coming with vocal fold paralysis after a thyroid surgery, and the thyroid surgeon said that it was 
diving through the tumor in the thyroid uh, gland, and that uh, a long distance of the vocal fold has of the I'm sorry of the recurrent laryngeal nerve has been removed like three four centimeters. So you are not expecting any recovery in this situation. There is a big glottal gap. You can go with thyroplasty. If there is a small one, then you can go for fascia injection. Uh, certain cases are very interesting because you will find that synchronesis is developing. Uh, at some time, uh, you will find that there is a little bit of movement happening in the vocal fold, also that it is paralyzed. This movement, movement is sometimes attributed to the interarytenoid muscle. It can be attributed to the fact that when there is a small injury in the recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, and part of the nerve is being cut. So what happens is that when it grow again, the axons in the nerve, they do not necessarily go to the exact place. So sometimes instead of going like this, they go in, in a different way. And this sometimes explain why you have a certain small movement happening in the arytenoid. And it, it's not good for, for the voice because usually it is not the full movement of the arytenoids going down and closing with each other. So for these patients, I right now what I do is that I offer the temporary augmentation and also wait for six months. If the uh, patient vocal fold is still paralyzed, then I would do the, uh, the, the, uh, the permanent injection or the thyroplasty. And before I continue, and this is a very important, we do offer voice therapy to all patients. And it is, in my opinion, important to bear in mind that we need to have a good respiratory support and we need to have a patient who is able to make sure that he is using or she is using the right technique of uh, uh, voice production. Um, that's why I guess that quick intervention, which in this situation means that as soon as the patient to get uh, a vocal fold paralysis and you know of that, then there is no need to wait. We go right now within two, three weeks and do the injection. Uh, why? Because in this way, we are able to offer a good functional voice almost immediately after the problem with the uh, vocal fold has happened. I mean, in terms of the paralysis, uh, we also uh, in this way are able to reduce the symptoms coming from the vocal fold paralysis in terms of voice, in terms of uh, life quality, in terms of swallowing. There are some researches that has been done, published back in 2010, 11, and 16, that are a little bit interesting because they even claim that if you do quick intervention, then you would be needing less thyroplasty. In other words, that they are claiming that when you do the quick intervention after the, uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, then maybe the patient vocal fold is going to be in a fitter place. In other words, in the midline and the patient won't need a thyroplasty later on, despite the fact that the vocal fold is still paralyzed. I don't know. Sometimes I have, I get this feeling as well that when I do the injection uh, quickly for the patients, they, they are usually satisfied even if the vocal fold is still paralyzed because it is still in the midline. So I don't know if, if this is true or not. There has been a little bit of controversy. Some of the, um, uh, there is a hypothesis that when you do the injection, despite the fact that the filler disappeared, but you went through uh, a point of entrance, you injected a material. So you made some kind of a fight protect part that remains there despite that the filler disappeared. In other words, that you made some kind of reaction that is growing or that grow a little bit in that place of injection. And there is also another hypothesis about this, that when you do the injection as quick as possible into the vocal fold and this synchronesis is developing, so it offers a, a better place for the vocal fold while the synchronesis is happening. I really don't know if this is true, but in the end, I guess what is true is in the worst situation, the patient gets six months 
of good boys, no need to uh, wait on a sick leave at home, and no need to suffer from any financial or emotional problems coming from the fact that she is not going to work. Uh, how we do the quick intervention, there are many ways to do this. You can do that under local anesthesia, going from the thyroid, like what you see here, you have a needle coming for a male patient from the thyrohyoid under local anesthesia, going into the vocal fold that is paralyzed. And you see it in the beginning, it looks curved, it looks quite flaky, and it's uh, quite, uh, quite thin. And then with the injection going in, you will see that it is growing in. Let's say the width of the growing. And right now, the observation was at the end of the, uh, of the operation of the procedure, and the patient was is quite strained. And this is our aim. This is what we hope from this because hyaluronic acid has water with it, and the water is going to disappear in a couple of days. So when you do the over injection, you are making sure that you are compensating for the small amount of water that is going to disappear. So that's what we do all the time. We do the over injection. And that over injection is about 30% or 25%. Now going to one other thing that I, I usually think of when, in, when it comes to quick intervention. Uh, if you have a patient with paralysis that is untreated, in other words, that the patient didn't receive uh, injection or, or surgery um, and didn't receive voice therapy, then at some times there is a possibility that the patient, not knowing uh, the, the, the fact or not understanding what is happening, the patient can develop a wrong compensatory voice production technique. And this sometimes affects very much the uh, voice of the patient. And I have one example of a lady that came to me after a few months from the vocal fold paralysis that happened to her left vocal fold, which is paralyzed almost in the midline, but it is like one or two millimeters away from it. Right now we will see the video. And then what is important is to hear the voice of the patient because the video is not everything. You have to hear the, 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 vocal, the voice recording. And then you will understand what, she's, what she has been doing. Let us let the uh, voice go a little bit higher. And this is her video. <laughs> So what you see here is that the video is not the best one, but you see a vocal fold that is paralyzed almost in the midline and the patient based on the video, she has a nice voice. She's just saying hee hee hee. And this was examined through the throat. So the patient is, you know, all having the tongue outside and so on. Let us hear her voice when she's talking, her spontaneous voice or her recorded voice from a text. And for example, this one. Did you hear that, Haldun? Yeah. Okay, so what is happening here is that you have a patient with a vocal fold almost in the midline, but it is just one millimeter away. A video which is without stroposcopy, so it is not the best one. And uh, there is no video done with a fibroscope showing the spontaneous or the, the, the while the patient is reading a, uh, a text. And accordingly, when you, when you listen, when you see this, you think, okay, this looks nice. But when you, when you listen to the voice, the voice is very high. The voice is quite abnormal. It, it looks like it hears as if Minnie Mouse is, uh, uh, is, is talking. But when you do the injection, you have this one millimeter corrected. You see how it looks like on the stroposcope. You find that it is looking much better. And you listen to the voice, you will understand the difference. Now let us see the voice after the... <laughs> so 
So right now, this is a couple of months after the injection. The vocal folds, they are closing much better. Still, the left vocal fold is paralyzed, but you have a very nice closure. And the, uh, the stroboscopy is uh, helping you to see, the, to see that the wave is happening. And now when you listen to the voice of the patient, you will understand the difference coming from the augmentation. And here is the after. He näyttävät paraikaan auttima aamuruoka vuodessa. Aamuruoan jälkeen lasse menee loikoilemaan. Hän odottelee, että Nikke soittaisi ovikelloa. Mutta siinä ei taidakaan tietä, kuka Nikke on. So what is happening is that her voice after the injection that, oh, that strange uh, very high F0 or pitch went down. And this is exactly what I was talking about, that some patients develop a wrong compensatory technique, and then after the injection, you can get it in the right way. I will go forward to the atrophic dysphonia, uh, because I, I know from Haldun that we also have to reserve some time for the questions. And when it comes, right now, uh, we, had, we had some on, uh, like some talk on the, on the vocal fold paralysis. We'll also go through the injection and how to do that. But I would like to give a, a couple of slides on atrophic dysphonia, which is, in, in my opinion, a very important subject. Atrophic dysphonia, as you know, is different. In other words, it can be uh, like small change like here. So a traffic dysphonia can be like a small, mild uh, curvedness or bowing of the vocal folds in which the patient herself would come to you and say, okay, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm speaking, it is fine, but when I speak for too long or for somehow a longer time, then I feel that my voice is, is, is getting uh, uh, weak and when she's singing on the, on the higher notes, her voice is not working well. And this is what you see here, that she was able to have a very nice wave on the lower and normal uh, F0, but as soon as she went up, she had this situation that the vocal folds are vibrating in totally different phases. And then she gets the, the, the hoarseness. And for this situation, this is mild. For this patient, I would be personally offering voice therapy. If she is interested to, uh, to have augmentation, then we can think about it. But for other patients, it can be quite <laughs> So for other patients, it can be quite like an invalidity to the patient that the patient is having major bowing in the vocal folds. The vocal folds, they are, they are too curved and, and the air is coming through and in the end, these patients probably, they will not benefit much from voice therapy. Of course, we will give it to them, but, but in the end, we have to also aim for injection and even for thyroplasty, which is something that I'm going to tell about. Um, I will not go too much about this, but for you, of course, all of you, this is quite common that when you have atrophy, then you expect to have bowing of the book of folds, you expect to have an oval-shaped glottis. You expect to have a change in the F0. You expect to have a change in the acoustics of voice. So what is happening is that instead of having vocal folds that are closing very well, there is air coming through, and this air is going to increase the noise in the background. And the histology is behind that, that with time, you have increased stiffness in the vocal folds, you have decreased thickness of the lamina propria. The mucus secretion is going to decrease, making it uh, more viscid. So the vocal folds are not really happy when they are when they are vibrating. And in other words, there is more stiffness in the in the vocal fold uh, edges. Um, 
also it comes with changes. I mean, when aging comes, it comes with changes in the in the surface area of the lungs, in the chest wall, elasticity, and all of this is going to intervene. Um, when, when we talk about treatment of vocal fold atrophy, I personally like very much this article that was published in the Larynx Code back in 2014, which is like a review article about the optimal treatment of crispophonia. Uh, voice therapy, injection laryngoplasty, or the vocal fold augmentation, bilateral medialization thyroplasty, they are all appropriate choices for treating the aging voice. What I personally do is that I make sure about what the patient herself wants. Some patients they are quite happy that there is no cancer in the larynx and this is enough for them. That's fine. There is no need to be actively offering treatment if the patient is not willing for that. If the patient would like to have some kind of treatment, then voice therapy is probably the first one. If the patient is not happy with voice therapy, then I would go for vocal fold augmentation. If the patient is not happy with the fact that vocal fold augmentation is not permanent, then I would go for thyroplasty type, uh, type one on both sides. And right now, this is what I'm following in my department. So we get a patient who is having uh, atrophic dysphonia. The patient is diagnosed. She is seeking activity treatment. We offer voice therapy. If the patient is not happy, then we do the voice lab, record the patient voice, have the injection, and then do a voice lab again because it's very important to be objectively doing the examination before and after. The acoustics, in my opinion, they are very reliable if they are taken from the same patient in a standardized way. As you all know, there is no hemoglobin for the voice. So it's, it's very important to be sure that you are doing it for the same patient before and after. If the patient is getting the injection and like to come back again and uh, and then says, right now I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that I'm coming too much to you every year. I'd like to have a permanent, uh, permanent solution. Then thyroplasty using Vortex can be the answer. And of course, the voice lab after that to make sure that it works for her or for her objectively. So it is not enough to have your own impression or the patient impression. How we do the vocal fold uh, augmentation under local anesthesia. Um, there are many ways. You can go transoral, thyrohyoid, transcricothyroid, and I personally would prefer to go transoral. This is what we have been doing most of the time in Helsinki. Uh, one of the important things is that to make sure that you have a colleague that you are able to work with quite frequently because in the end, if you have the same scopist with you, then you are able to develop some kind of telepathy that is going to be very well for the injection. In other words, that you must have a scopist who is good enough and that you are, you are familiar with and you can work with. Uh, for example, when, when I do the injections, I would say that almost 90 or 85% of them are with Samuel Kimmery here in Helsinki. So I know that I, I have the one that I'm all the time working with. Samuel Kimmery also have the same rule. So it's, it's very good to make sure that you have the same scopist all the time or most of the time. Uh, we start with the local anesthesia. Um, I personally like to use what you see here, which is called an atomizer. So the idea is that if you see my arrow moving on the, uh, uh, on the screen, there is uh, about, it depends, two to four millimeters of lidocaine 4% is better in my opinion, or in, if you don't have it, then you can use 2%. Going through the atomizer, coming out as like spray. And uh, we use it, uh, we, before the COVID, we used to have the xylocaine spray, the nafotsulin uh, before the fibroscopy. Right now, what I do is that I have a cotton with lidocaine in the nose, uh, for the uh, for the patient uh, mouse, I would be I would be using this spray as well, but 
in the beginning it is forward and then I tilt it. And um, as I said, 4% lidocaine up to five millimeters, milliliters, you will not use more than that. You should aim for all of the bars that you are going to touch. Uh, so the supraglottal and the glottal area. A little bit you're going to go through the subglottis, which is totally fine. And here is a video showing how it looks like. <laughs> So what, what you have seen here is a patient is coughing and we tell that to the patient before the inject before the anesthesia. And actually this coughing is quite good because it will be spraying or sending the anesthesia everywhere. Uh, when we are putting it on the vocal folds, we start first with the, uh, the, uh, the root of the tongue and then bolicula and also the epiglottis and then we'll go down to the vocal folds while the patient is saying long E so you have the vocal folds, you have the false vocal folds as well with the anesthesia. And it's fine to have the patient coughing a little. And then we choose which way we are going through. You, I would personally go most of the time, as I said, with the transoral. For some of the patients, it is not the best way. Transoral is nice because the first contact that you are having between the needle and the vocal fold is on the vocal fold. So for patients with Marivan for patients with anticoagulants, you would be expecting almost no hematoma if the first contact is happening in the transoral route in the vocal fold. Because the vocal fold, the, the amount of blood vessels that it has is, is, is very small. And in the end, the expectation of hematoma is less with the transoral of course, it is a totally different story if you are going thyroid or creek thyroid through the neck. How it looks like after the anesthesia, you will be introducing the needle. I usually use the Renu needle, which has a double uh, like black markings. One of them, I will make sure that it is below the, uh, the top of the vocal fold and the other is above it. And then I'll be starting with the augmentation of the right or left vocal folds. Uh, or, or, and, and you will see that the vocal folds, with, with uh, the uh, thickness of the vocal folds is increasing. And then you would go for the other one. For a case of atrophy, I would be preparing to do the injection in the middle third. And. <coughs> Uh, this is what we have been using, and this is a transoral needle, a double bev bevel, and then um, if you go trans um, uh, thyrohyoid, uh, that would be probably for males, and it means that we'll be going from uh, above the thyroid cartilage or between it and the hyoid one. And going through means that you will have the same situation which we saw in, uh, in, a, in the video before. After the anesthesia, you will have the needle going through it and you will be able to do the injection. For this, I would be using a long needle, which is uh, eight centimeters, 23 is a gauge, uh, and that will be enough. Uh, for the trans, uh, for the trans thyroid, I would be going from below if the patient is uh, is a female and she doesn't have a prominent thyroid cartilage and in a condition in which that patient is having a very severe gag reflex, so I will not be able to do a transoral. And the reason is that when you go from the cricothyroid, so you are coming from lower to up. And there is a little bit problem that the, uh, the view is not at its best. You will see what I mean in a moment. 
So right here, I'm coming from below the right vocal fold. You'll see the needle, there is something right now there. Yes, this is the needle. And then you have to go from below up. And at some time, you may see that you are too superficial. If you see a little bit of uh, the injection material coming out, you'll see that in a moment. And then you will have to push the needle more inside. One way of checking your place is, now you see it, that there was something bobbing up. That means that it was superficial. So you had to go more to the inside. One other way is to move the needle a little bit. And in that way, you are able to have the injection. As I said, this is usually like the third, the third way or the third option that I have. For this, I would be using the smaller, the shorter one. Four centimeters is enough. Uh, and that will be probably the, uh, the one suitable for the males and females alike. Uh, for the preoperative care, what I tell them is to have uh, fasting for six hours or if the patient is coming in the end of the day, then it will be a light breakfast and uh, one gram paracetamol if needed. We don't use diabam or diazepam. There is no need to stop the anticoagulants if you are going peroral. Um, after the, uh, the, uh, the operation, they will be waiting for one hour. Right now, because of the COVID-19, I've been them. I've been saying to them to wait for 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, some adults company on at home in the first night because it's important because we didn't have any problems so far with seeing a patient who had been, for example, suffering from severe edema after the injection. I didn't see that, or let us say, severe edema that necessitated tracheostomy. But we have uh, heard of there are some cases reported of patients tracheostomized for uh, uh, some kind of anaphylactic reaction or edema after the injection. So it is much better to be on the safe side and to have someone who is able to call the ambulance and to be sure that the patient can get to the emergency room. Uh, Boys rest, I would give it for two days the day of the operation, the second day, in my opinion, it's, it's much easier for me to imagine that the, uh, the material is going to remain inside and that the entrance, plane is, uh, the entrance is going to close in a couple of days. Uh, one week of sick leave is usually enough. We had done over 300 patients, 340 patients. I have one hematoma, uh, and I abandoned the operation uh, at that time. And that was done trans The patient had an anticoagulant and there was a little bit of misunderstanding about the anticoagulant. And three patients had been having this very interesting movement of the vocal folds in synchrony with respiration. So I've been there with a needle and trying to find the exact place in which I'm going to enter while the patient is is having this, uh, this, uh, this movement with respiration. It, one of them ended up in the, uh, uh, in the uh, range spaces and it opened, uh, I opened it immediately. Uh, uh, market generalized edema, I have never seen it. Uh, three abandoned cases we had. Uh, one of them, uh, I was told about that the patient when, uh, when, when he sees the, uh, the needle, he would be like going into syncope at the same time. Uh, one of them uh, uh, was, the other one was, was me. And that patient, she had a, a situation which you, when, when you come close to her, even after the anesthesia and very good anesthesia, then she would be like having this gag reflex and, uh, and a little bit of laryngeal spasm. And I decided that it would be much better to do it under general anesthesia. Uh, so it's, it's, it's sometimes, you would have these unfavorable conditions under anesthesia, after anesthesia. And in that time, if, if it doesn't look like it is going to succeed and, and you know that this is not going to work, then there is no need to, to continue and you can cancel it. Um, uh, one of the patients that came uh, is here. She uh, came to me back in 2016 and, uh, and, uh, and she had this atrophy 
that was diagnosed in June and she got the injection. And right now you'll see before the injection and one year after the injection. And she is a female, 69 years old. And uh, it looks like this. So you, you, you see right now that her vocal folds are quite bowed and even the stroposcopy was not working well with them because of the, uh, uh, the problem with the symmetricity of the, uh, of the, of the acoustics. And then one year, after, one year after the injection, it looked like... This. So you have more contact, you have more, uh, uh, more thickness, and the patient voice, even from this video, it sounds as if she is getting younger a little bit. Um, one thing that we talked about is that if the vocal fold injection is uh, regarded by the patient that he, you know, like he, she has been coming for it every one year or every second year, and she is not happy, then one of the options is to go with cortex seroplasty, which is one option. We didn't do it much. I would remember thyroplasty for vocal fold atrophy for actually two or three patients. So it is like the last step. And, uh, and the reason is that usually the patients are happy with the injection. But if you have to go forward, then you can use a, a Gore-Tex. And the Gore-Tex is nice because you can, when it comes to the, atroph to the atrophic patient, they have vocal folds that are moving. The problem with them is that they are both. So what do you aim for is the middle third of the vocal fold. And you would like to keep the vocal folds moving still. So you cannot use, for example, a Montgomery implant. You can use a, a, a huge silicone implant, but you can go for a Gore-Tex small uh, material. You are able to mold it. You are able to have it by the middle third and you are able to push it forward. How it looks like, this is what I, what I meant, that if you use a Montgomery, then you are pushing much of the uh, cartilage. But when you use Montgomery, if you make a smaller opening, then you can be sure that you are going to the right place. So for example, here is a patient. This is a thyroid cartilage. This is the superior edge. This is the anterior edge. The vocal fold should be here. And then you make small opening exactly by the level of the middle third of the vocal fold and then have the cortex uh, like drawn inside pushing the middle third so you will be having something that looks like this this is the right vocal fold this is the left vocal fold we have the thyroplasty done the cortex coming from here so that's why it looks like this was the middle third going to the inside uh, right now, I would like to end my presentation with this last slide about the demand, about Turkey. So uh, one of the things is that uh, the, uh, this is very important because when I was in medical school, we were taught about the population vermin. And right now, the vermin is disappearing from Turkey as well. So what is happening is that back in 1990, there was truly almost a pyramid in, in, in Turkey with the population. So right here you see how it looked like with the with population. I mean, most of the Turks, they were, let us say, less than 50 year, five years old. And then it goes very, very small when they get uh, older. Right now, we are in 2020, but in 2024, it is uh, a cylinder. It's like uh, one of the towers. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's changing. So if you see about it, those who are 55 or less, they are still there, but there is more happening when it comes to the older ones, their number and their percentage of the population, which is of course increased by, or going to increase by so it's 3 million. Uh, right now, probably it is 80, if I understand correctly, or 82, but, but by 2024, it will be 86 million. Uh, and you will, you will be having more and more older patients. I don't know about the retirement age in, in Turkey right now, but the problem is that by the long time, money will not be enough. So the retirement age is going to be shifted 
forward and it's going to be um, to be more. And at that time, you would be having more and more patients coming to your office uh, who are teachers who are doing jobs that include presenting, talking, dealing with customers, and their voices, they are going with age uh, uh, to, to, to be pressy, but you have to offer them something. And that's what I have noticed in the last years, that when we started with vocal cord augmentation for, for atrophy, we had one patient uh, a month. And then at some time, it was like four or five patients every second week. A second week. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's growing. And I guess this is one of uh, the most important things that we'll be doing in the future in our oncology and pediatrics. So by this, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Thank you very much. This was a really uh, excellent presentation. That really reflects the experience that you have. And it was great to listen to you. We have a very nice dedicated participant group and it's really international. You cannot believe it. Uh, I will share their cities with you later, but this is a really international group. We have friends from Brazil to Russia. And of course, uh, the majority is from Turkey and the second leading country is uh, Egypt. We have lots of Egyptian uh, ENTs and pediatricians with us. And they have excellent questions for you. Okay. So uh, I will just try to put them in a line and I will try to ask them in the way that you have reflected in your presentation. Actually, the first one is not uh, just exactly about this presentation, but about the beginning of the evaluation of patients. One of our friends asked you that, how do you standard, standardize the acoustic capture? I, I, I think the voice recordings, how do you standardize it be, be before, before the procedure and after the procedure? That's a very good question. So uh, what we usually do, there are two things that we do. One of them is probably the same that is being done everywhere. We record, of course, the voice of the patient. In other words, when the patient is explaining, we give him a picture and then that picture is like the same for everyone and he will be commenting or she will be commenting about it. And this is spontaneous. There is also a certain speech text, I'm sorry, that is standardized for all of our patients. They will be reading it. And this is the part that is probably being done in every part of the world. What I like to do, and this is what we do in the voice lab, is that to standardize according to the DB, according to the, uh, to the strengths of the voice. So one of the good things is that we usually ask the patient to, uh, I mean, in, in, uh, we, before, a long time before, we used to ask the patient to say a long ah at the most comfortable level or a long E at the most comfortable level. But that most comfortable level for me today, if I'm happy, can be 80 to spell. And tomorrow, if I'm not very happy, then it can be 60. And accordingly, you cannot compare them. So the best thing is to have the DB to be the same. So we ask the patient to have R at 60, 70, and 80 decibels. And in that way, you can have this comparison before and after. And when you have the DB, the strength of the voice is the same, then you are able to go for all of the changes, the subtle changes, happening in the harmonic to noise ratio and the jitter and the shimmer and in the F0 as well. This is a very interesting detail because uh, as we all know, all know the, uh, the decibel can change uh, from lots of things, from the microphone, from the distance from the microphone. So all of the parameters that are related with the uh, loudness of voice, uh, Shimmer at first will be changing, I think. So this is a very uh, important detail. Thank you. And and actually, of course, we we do have a voice uh, booth. I mean, the one like being used for the uh, audiometry recordings and same distance from the microphone, and patient is inside. So it's uh, yeah. And the second one is for an idiopathic vocal fold paralysis or for a, a thyroidectomized patient. And the patient has symptoms, so uh, she or he is requesting our help about his or her voice. And how do you decide to give just voice therapy 
or voice therapy plus injection. I mean, how do you decide it? There is a very small gap there, yeah. but the patient requests are help. Uh, so uh, how do you decide to continue just by voice therapy or voice therapy plus uh, early injection? Uh, it depends very much on what the patient is doing. Uh, so what is happening is that uh, in a real life situation, the patient would be coming to me. Uh, I would be assessing the patient's needs of the voice. I would be telling that we can start with the voice therapy. If the patient is, uh, let us say, 70 something, living alone, doesn't use much uh, her voice uh, in, in, in social activities, then probably she will be herself telling that uh, there's no need to think about vocal cold injection right now. Uh, but if the patient is kind of active and, uh, and, uh, and, and the voice is bad, then I would go to offer a vocal cold injection. So it's uh, to a huge extent, it is subjective based on the patient needs and what, uh, uh, what the patient is doing in her life. Okay. And if we decided to make an early injection, we will make an early injection. And you have told us that you always recommend your patients voice therapy. They all get voice therapy. So when will we begin the voice therapy? I mean, after the, just after in injection, uh, you told us that you give a voice rest of two days, uh, if I realized correctly. And how, uh, how, how many days later will they begin the voice therapy and how frequently? Uh, what, what we usually do is that we, when we start the voice therapy, when we decide that we will get voice therapy for the patient, then we hope that it will be two weeks from the time during the, which the, the patient met the, uh, the medical doctor. And uh, at that time, if we plan to have a vocal fold injection, then the patient can start the voice therapy before the injection and can continue it one week after the injection. So it's just for one week or two weeks at the maximum after the injection during which the, the patient is not getting voice therapy. Okay, so you begin it as early as possible, the yeah. voice therapy, and you continue it beginning from one week from injection. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Some of the patients, what, what, I, what I notice is that, of course, some of the patients, they are quite happy with the results. So they will call the voice therapist and say, you know, everything is fine. I, I don't think that I need it. And, uh, and this is okay because also it lessens the burden on the uh, voice therapist in terms of the number of patients that we have right now. And one of the questions is about the special period that we are uh, actually living right now. Uh, what I mean is for, for, the, for the people that are not with us uh, today in the webinar, we will also uh, be publishing this in YouTube. Uh, we are passing through a, a very strange and difficult time that the whole world is facing a pandemic. So. One of our attendees is asking you if, uh, I mean, what are the conditions uh, that you have changed during the pandemics while making office procedures and also in the uh, operating room? That's a very good question. Uh, for the office procedures and for the operating rooms, uh, for situations in which you are going through the, uh, the mucosa, or using lasers or shavers, or doing an operation for more than 30 minutes uh, inside the larynx, then you would be uh, doing two things. You would be first taking, what, what we do is that we take uh, COVID-19, uh, we take, I'm, I'm sorry, we take a, a PCR test from the patient two days before the operation. The patient will go to the test. The test is going to be taken and the patient is going to be in quarantine till she or he leaves for the operation. The idea is to make sure that the patient does not get an infection after a negative test that has been taken two days before the operation. Uh, so this is about the testing. And this includes all of the situation in which we go through the mucosa. That uh, will be, of course, followed by the fact that we do the operations in um, if they are under general anesthesia, then we will be dealing with uh, the negative pressure of the room, of the operation room. 
we'll be also using the personal protective equipment, including the FFP, the, um, uh, the eyeglasses, uh, the, um, the coats, and uh, um, the head cover. So all of this will be taken into consideration. And I guess this means that probably we are facing a new normal situation. And it seems that it is going to be taking quite long before it subsides. Yeah. Uh, would you also like to say a few words about the UEP paper? Yes. If, he, if everyone, if there's someone who is interested, uh, there is a, a position statement that include all of this about the personal protective equipment, about the laryngology and the voice operations, tracheostomy, and it is published by the UAB. The position statement, if you search for it, the easiest way would be to search for it on ResearchGate. Uh, just type Union of European Phonetricians, uh, Haldun Ogos or Ahmed Ganeid, because we are both co-writers, and or John Rubin, Tadeusz Nauka, you will find 24 or 26 names to choose from. And you will find all of the information that we were talking about in terms of pharyngology, phoniatrics, and different operations. And a beautiful question. And the, the participant is asking us, uh, how do you decide uh, to inject for vocal fold atrophy? And, and he is mentioning that, uh, how many months do you just continue with voice therapy? And when is the exact time for injection for, for atrophy? Yeah. Uh, for, for atrophy, the, uh, we start with voice therapy. The voice therapy sessions, usually we don't give more than five. And these five can be distributed based on what the patient and the voice therapist agree on. After the voice therapy, if the patient is not happy and the uh, the, the voice is still, uh, in, in the patient's opinion, is not enough, then we will go with the vocal fold atrophy and uh, with the vocal fold augmentation, I'm sorry, for the atrophy. And that can be happen when within a couple of weeks or one month, depending on the first time, the first free time that we have. Another question is, uh, how do you follow the early signs of recovery? Are you using EMG or how, uh, how often do you see the patient? Uh, you made an early injection and how do you follow them? Uh, what, I, what I do is that we do the injection. We ask the patient to come uh, for uh, follow up. If the patient is a vocal fold paralysis patient, then that patient will be coming two months after the injection and then at a maximum of six months after the time of the, uh, of the injection. Of course, I assume that the injection happened within one to two months from the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. For the vocal fold paralysis, we do the follow-up at uh, two months and one year. Uh, sorry, I now mix it up. For the vocal fold paralysis, two months, six months. For the atrophy, two months, one year. The reason is that for the vocal fold paralysis, at two months, you check that there is a good effect of the injection. At six months, you decide, is the vocal fold moving right now? Are we happy or not? While for the atrophy, you are doing that after two months to check for the effect of the injection. And you are doing that after one year because probably the patient uh, material is going to disappear and you will need to do another injection sometime. Okay, and then how do you decide it? I mean, at the sixth month for a uh, vocal fold paralysis patient, uh, do you only use chip on tip or video laryngostroboscopy, or do you also use EMG? I, I don't use uh, EMG because it depends very much on what I see and what I hear. And what I see, I mean the movement of the vocal folds, and what I hear, which include two things, the voice of the patient and what the patient herself is saying. I mean, if the patient is saying that right now the voice is good, I am happy with it and also when I hear the voice as well. So these are the two things that are important in my opinion. The optical uh, examination and the acoustical or perceptual examination that you're doing. While when it comes to the EMG, uh, EMG is very good uh, in telling you 
um, in situation when there is, uh, like for example, Paris is, uh, in other situations in which you would like to know if reinnervation is still happening. But uh, in my experience with idiopathic vocal fold paralysis, the vocal fold, if it is going to move, it will move within eight months. Actually, there is a very interesting question, which I very like. When I moderate sessions about office procedures, this is uh, one of the best questions that I like, my, my favorite ones. The name of your presentation is office-based procedures. So uh, how do you define the office? Uh, I mean, I'm in my office now, and this is, this is a, this is a you, you, you didn't have the chance to come to Ankara, but this is a, a this is a building of, uh, 23 floors, okay, uh, and I am in my office. Uh, this is an ENT and phoniatrics office, and you are in your office now, and I know the uh, building very well because uh, I was also there as a patient, so, <laughs> and, and your office is in a hospital. The question is that, uh, how do you define the office? Can we make the office injections uh, in an office like mine? And uh, she is also asking if we need an anesthetist <laughs> around? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, in my opinion, uh, an office injection means that you have the ability to call an anesthesiologist from the same uh, building in which you are doing the injection. So if you have 23 floors in, in, in the tower and you are one of them, and, and in my opinion, if you have an anesthesiologist who is in the same tower, or within like 10, 15 minutes away from you, then that's, that's an office space. Uh, but, but if you have a situation in which you, you don't have an anesthesiologist ready to come within 10 minutes from the same building or from the surroundings, then I would not uh, do office space procedure in this situation because I didn't, uh, in, in this uh, vocal fold augmentation, I never needed an anesthesiologist. I mean, under, uh, under local anesthesia. But I'm, I'm always keeping in mind that one day, maybe I will need. And uh, uh, I, I guess it's, it's much safer to play on the safe side. Actually, for the ones that are also, uh, that are also uh, requesting my response, uh, I also feel uh, better when I do things in a in a hospital, and I cannot uh, I cannot just rotate because I am using the computer's uh, webcam now, but I am see the, seeing the hospital from here. Okay, the hospital is just beside my building. That that that's why I can work here. <laughs> that's, that's where that's where I, where I feel safe. And one of one of the things is that when we talk uh, office, we probably mean by the uh, by the outpatient. So it is an outpatient procedure uh, in which the patient, it is not day surgery where the patient is, uh, is, is uh, or it is not a general anesthesia surgery. Uh, and it is not a surgery done in the operation room where you will be probably, uh, I mean, the operation room for one hour, it is in Helsinki, it is about 700 to 900 euros. So I mean, the, the cost that is coming from using the operation room. So when you're using it outpatient, it's it's a totally different uh, different cost. Yeah. Okay. And you know Ilter very well. Ilter had a question. Ah. Although although we had uh, a talk about office based procedures, uh, he requested us to talk a few words about the fascia lata. Yes. Uh, the the fascia is is very good when. Um, when it is being used for vocal fold paralysis. My experience so far is that it is not going to be stable and permanent in a moving vocal fold. So I would use it with vocal fold paralysis. This is one thing. Uh, the other thing, we have used it mostly under general anesthesia, but we have also cases in which we use it under local anesthesia. If someone is interested in fascia lata, and using it under local anesthesia for vocal fold paralysis as a permanent injection, then there is uh, an article published by Tim Kennery and me 
and I guess it was published two, three years ago. Uh, you just write vocal fold augmentation fascia and then you'll find it. Okay. Uh, as all of the injectables are absorbed in some time, some of them are short term and some of them are long term, uh, how many times can you repeat that injection? That's a very good question. I used to think that, um, you know, like three, four times, but, uh, but actually more than that. <laughs> it's, uh, um, I know of a patient that was injected so far about 13 times. 13? Yeah, yeah, one, three. And, uh, and, uh, uh, you you can do the injections. Uh, the, the main problem that you will face is that when, with more injections you are doing, you are creating you are creating more fibrosis. So at some time when you do the injection, you do it from here. It is coming in the same time away, or it is not going through because it's uh, sometimes there is too much fibrosis. So uh, and also it depends on what you are injecting. So if you are injecting hyaluronic acid, I guess you can do that like. 15 times or even more. With calcium hydroxyapatite, it creates more fibrosis. So you will be not, you'll not be able to do many injections. But uh, I used to say three, four, now I'd say more. Okay. I think uh, we, can, we can combine it with another question from Setup. She was asking how the pyramid or the cylinder is looking in Finland. Because, oh, it, uh, yeah. because actually, if we are talking about atrophic dysphonia, and the number of injections uh, will, may increase with the life, life expectation of patients. Yeah. I, I guess in the future, it will be like an inverted pyramid. <laughs> so it's, it, it has been a cylinder and, uh, um, and I guess it, uh, it, will, it will remain like this. Even you will find it that on the long term, it is expected that uh, this is going to turn a little bit with, um, with the smaller ages of the population getting a little bit uh, less. I mean, the number of them. The number of children is getting less and the number of older people is getting more. Yeah. And also, uh, today's, uh, today's subjects are vocal fold paralysis and atrophic dysphonia, but there are uh, some other reasons of glottal insufficiency as well like that we face more and more every day, the vocal fold scar. Yeah. What do you recommend for vocal fold scar in the office? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so far, my experience with vocal fold scars is uh, to do injection um, um, with hyaluronic acid in the beginning and to make sure that the patient is getting help from that and then to do after that calcium hyaluronic uh, The uh, hyaluronic acid can be injected lateral to the scar. One of the problems with the scar is that in the office, in my opinion, there is not much that you can do. Uh, I do not really think that injecting cortisone in a scar that has been for some time is going to help. I, I don't think so. So what, what I do is that, um, and I don't have actually many patients with scars. I would go for injection of the lateral side of the vocal fold. And um, if I would like to make sure that this is 100% a scar, then of course I will be doing the fibroscopy with the MBI to uh, make sure first about how it looks like with, on the MBI. You will be able to see very nicely the, uh, the, the blood vessels and how they look like and the formation of the scar to make sure that it is not sulcus or something else that is a little bit down. So, but, but the injection is going to be lateral. But I, I, I do cortisone injections, but, but, uh, but for other reasons. Okay. And one, one other question is about the amount of the injectable. Yeah. I mean, while we are making it in the office under local anesthesia, it's easily uh, it's easier that we can see the amount that we have injected, and we can also uh, simultaneously see the closure pattern of the vocal folds. But when you are using fascia under general, how do you decide the amount of injection that you use? 
uh, under general anesthesia, you are all the time seeing the vocal fold. And usually we do that under uh, jib ventilation. So you have a very good idea about the position of the vocal fold and about the, the medial age, because you don't have a tube, an intubation tube that is pushing it away. Uh, and when you are injecting with fascia, you don't have to do like 30%, 15 or 20% over injection is going to be enough. And you will, in my experience, you will never need more than 0 0.4 uh, milliliters of fascia. Uh, with fascia, it's sticky, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's thick, and I'm sure you will, you will never need more than 0 0.4 milliliters. Okay. Uh, one, 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 one comment, uh, because right now with the COVID-19, one of the good, um, uh, one of the good, uh, nice alternatives to jet ventilation is the flow uh, volume control ventilation, which is uh, like using the small, very small intubation tubes, the tri tubes, the Ventinova ones, and this is can be a very good, uh, very good, um, like compensation or very good in terms of uh, of having a small tube still with a cuff there. And with this very small tube that is less than four millimeters, you are able to assess in a much better way the, uh, the vocal folds. Yeah. Amit, this was an excellent talk. And now we are like in our 75th minute. So uh, this may be the last question, I think. Uh, and this comes from our mutual friend, uh, Tamer. Uh, so Tamer, Tamer is asking about injection to uh, pediatric patients. I mean, the pediatric patients under 18 years old in the office. What do you think about office procedures in pediatric cases? No, I, I have to admit that I, I have never done it for uh, patients under 18 in the office. Um, and uh, no, I, I, I guess none of uh, there, there has been so far no need. Uh, I don't know about the future, uh, but but I I I didn't do it in the office. Actually, actually from some of our uh, conferences, I remember a colleague. I I couldn't uh, remember his name, but but he was making great video laryngostroboscopies, rigid video stroboscopies with pediatric cases. Uh, Campos. Uh, uh huh. It's, uh, it's very difficult to uh, deal with pediatric cases sometimes, but some of them are very silent, better than most of adults. But uh, as far as I see, I don't also see as much pediatric cases as we work with adult cases. But uh, I think this may change according to the needs of the patient and the cooperation between the patient and us, I think. And of course, the, uh, uh, the parents as well. <laughs> yes, yes, that's, that's very true. Yeah. I would like to say a few words uh, before closing this session. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to host Ahmed today. It was a really great experience for me to be with uh, such, an, uh, such a great friend that I admire very much to be with him. And this was a meeting of Professional Voice Society Turkey, but uh, we have a bigger uh, sister society, which we call the Union of European Pediatricians. So I recommend our attendees, our participants, to follow the uh, social media pages and the websites of Union of European Pediatricians, and of course, Professional Voice Society as well, to be able to uh, know and learn the, the coming uh, meetings, the seminars, uh, or the webinars uh, that we will be uh, making, experiencing together. Ahmed, I would like to thank you very, very much. And I'm leaving the last words to you before closing the session. Thank you. It has been a very uh, nice experience for me. I've been moderating the uh, number of uh, UAB webinars and other ones, but uh, I guess this is one of the first times in which I'm speaking in a webinar. I'm a speaker. <laughs> So it's a very interesting experience because you know that there are people listening, but you don't see them. Uh, I'm very thankful to all of you and to the attendants and also to you, Haldun. It has been a pleasure. And I'm sure that hopefully soon we'll be meeting, maybe in Turkey, maybe, maybe in Helsinki, somewhere around <laughs> the world. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank, uh, I would like to also thank to our audience for following us with their questions. And 
And I want to inform all of them that we will be having another webinar two weeks later in English and one week later in Turkish. And I hope to see you all soon. So have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.